Okay, I think we can start. So welcome everyone. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Let me just allow me to introduce myself. Please, I ask everyone to collaborate by switching off your microphones. Thank you very much. My name is Matteo Passoni. I work at Politecnico di Milano. I am a researcher and professor belonging to the energy department of Politecnico di Milano. I teach uh, nuclear physics and plasma physics. Uh, among my research activities, uh, there, is also, uh, there are also activities related to nuclear fusion. And in this year, I'm currently serving as head of the master program in nuclear engineering. In nuclear engineering at Politecnico di Milano. So I think that these very few notes uh, are enough to understand how glad I am uh, to find uh, a field uh, uh, Aula Rogers here at Politecnico di Milano after quite some time and hundreds of people connected at home for this event, uh, which is related to nuclear fusion. The program for this event is quite simple to be said. There will be a short introduction in which, uh, after these few notes, uh, I would like to give the floor to Isabella Nova and uh, Francesca Ferrazza for reasons I'm going to say. Then we will give the floor to Professor Dennis White to listen to his speech, which is related to fusion. What next? And then we will have, I hope, plenty of time to discuss with you about the outcomes related to Dennis White's presentation, but also your previous knowledge, curiosities, which are related to the subject. So uh, without further ado, I think it can be useful to give a proper context uh, to this event, um, starting from Politecnico di Milano, uh, you should know that the Politecnico di Milano, in this academic year, an educational program called Green Ambassador has been launched. And since nuclear fusion is, I mean, very often connected uh, with the world of green technologies, I think it's important, it can be useful, it can be a good opportunity to have some information about the program. And so it cannot be better to have here the responsible of the Green Ambassador program here at Politecnico di Milano, Professor Isabella Nova, and I will give uh, immediately the word to her. Thank you, Matteo. And uh, as he said, I'm responsible for the new high-level training programs, the Polymi Ambassadors in Green Technologies, actually, and uh, in Smart Infrastructures. They've been activated last year by Polytechnico in order to create new professional figures able to have a very detailed skills in specific topics, the green technologies and smart infrastructures, but also in order to, while guaranteeing a systemic vision on, on the topics, so based on uh, interdisciplinary tools and, uh, and methods. And uh, I think that today's seminar is a very good occasion to, to, to increase, to extend actually the knowledge about the green technologies to a very huge and heterogeneous audience that, that is uh, the one I'm looking at. And um, well, I, I definitely believe that um, not only nuclear engineers should be able to talk about uh, nuclear fusion or fusion energy. I think it's a big responsibility for all the engineering and scientific com um, community all around the world to be able to talk, to know about what it's believed to be the, the energy source of the, of the future. And finally, I would like also to acknowledge the support done by ENI, such a big uh, energy company in, uh, in, uh, in Italy. Um, well, I think green technologies are the keys to, to a sustainable future. And in order to get there, I think that we need definitely a very detailed uh, knowledge. A very, we, we need to expand the knowledge in uh, research and innovation, but uh, we need to keep it grounded, to keep it linked to applied scientific knowledge as well. And this is definitely provided by, by the companies we work with. Thank you. So thank you very much, Isabella. And now uh, to complete the context, uh, you should know that actually Professor Dennis White is here in Italy because this is host by ENI. Uh, and so I think it's uh, very relevant and uh, suitable to give the floor to Francesca Ferrazza who is responsible for the activities related to nuclear fusion at ENI, I mean, to uh, share some considerations with us. Francesca. Thank you very much, Matteo. Thank you very much, Isabella. I'm very glad to be here uh, um, for myself and on behalf of the company. Uh, and thank you, Politecnico di Milano, for organizing this and 
having such a, a large attendance, which is very good to know, good to see. As a company, we are investing in, in fusion uh, as part of our decarbonization process, and uh, which aims at an industrial application, as was mentioned, but it also has, of course, technical and scientific parts to it. So uh, the occasion of having Professor White here giving a lecture on uh, what's next in the fusion space is very important for us. And um, uh, as I said, as a company, we are investing in fusion with uh, a name of industrial application. So I, uh, we, we have a dedicate, dedicated teams in, in engineering and R&D and support, which are in the company and some of the colleagues are here and others are connected. And I must mention that with the Polytechnic of Milan, we have a, a long-standing uh, collaboration. Uh, collaboration. Um, uh, very many technologies. Very many technologies. Uh, uh, green, green technologies, energy technologies in general, and also we have a, a deep collaboration with MIT and in particular with Professor White's uh, group. So I won't uh, go on uh, further and I pass the floor to Professor White. Thank you very much and enjoy the talk. So you think you think you? So thank you very much to Isabella and to Francesca. We can now move on and go into the main part of this event. So it's very nice to have students, uh, colleagues of Polytechnic Milano, researchers working in nuclear fusion also, not only at Polytechnic, but also in the Italian community, um, members belonging to the ENI company, but also other companies connected. So we have hundreds of people connected at home, besides the, I think, 150 or something like that here in presence. So uh, let me just, you had the opportunity to read about uh, Professor Dennis White uh, in the information uh, in the flyer we uh, gave you, but let me just say that currently Professor White is the director of the Plasma Science and Fusion Center at the MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He's working in the context of nuclear fusion uh, uh, in the last uh, 35 years uh, with a very enthusiastic approach as I uh, read uh, also in the notes uh, he wanted to share with you. So I think that now it's the time to give the floor to Professor Dennis White, please. I will just inform you when it will be about a few minutes uh, before the end. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, and thank you for the invitation. It's wonderful to be in front of a large group of students again. Uh, this is what uh, professors, we, we love. <laughs> we love to speak about this, but I think also the passion that comes from young people looking at difficult problems is one of the things that always motivates me. Um, so I'll, I'll actually start from a point of uh, not assuming that you know oh, what fusion is. And I will walk you through this. Um, and it's very important because understanding the underlying science of fusion is a very important aspect to understanding what then the real applications and the technical challenges will be. So what is fusion? It's simply the power source of the universe because this is what powers all stars. At the center of stars, hydrogen is fused into helium and produces large amounts of energy. I have to get a lo little local here too. Uh, it is also the source of artistic inspiration, as you see from this beautiful, which I took yesterday, um, a picture in, in, your, in your lovely uh, castle here in Milan. Um, it's been, it, it is an artistic inspiration because the sun has always been an artistic inspiration to us because it's the source of, of life on Earth. Um, but to get a little more uh, terrestrial, what is it? Well, in the end, it's really a sustainable terrestrial energy source. And what we're going to do is change a little bit, actually, how uh, the uh, sun works. We're going to fuse the heavy forms of hydrogen, deuterium and tritium, which you see in this reaction. They fuse together, and then this releases energy uh, through a neutron and a helium uh, particle. Okay, so let's get to it. So first of all, I'll also uh, mention that you've seen fusion is a very hot topic. A lot of news stories come up about fusion. It's often confusing uh, as well too to people because there's and part of it has to do with how many different ways there are to do fusion, but also it's simultaneously an applied and and kind of, kind of aspirational science that to do. And it's just like so. What, what's happening? So. Here, the, here is just in the last eight months. I'll, I'll talk. I'll talk. I'll, I'll insert all of these and hopefully provide some context to you. 
So there was a breakthrough in laser fusion in, 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 uh, in, in California, United States. There was the most recent announcement was a record amount of fusion energy from the jet token back in the United Kingdom. And there was our own announcement that actually came in fall of last year. So hopefully after the end of this, you'll have a little bit better context as to what's going on. But I'm going to start with the science, and it's very important. Where does fusion energy come from? It comes from the rearrangement of nuclei. This is why it's called nuclear fusion. So this is the most basic, one of the most important plots uh, in, in, in science, which is the binding energy or the free energy per nucleon uh, in nuclei as we go across the elements in the periodic table. So what happens when you rearrange nuclei is that if there's more mass... Uh, Sorry to interrupt you. Uh, they say that there is bad audio quality uh, from remote, so can we just try to oh. prove it? Maybe put it closer. Oh, a little closer right there? Let's try. How's that? One, two, three. Is it better? I can sit down and use the other microphone as well, too, if that is better. Otherwise, let's try to use uh, okay. switching on this one and staying still. Sure. Let's see whether it's better. Oh, I'm going to have to, I, I don't know, I, don't, I can't bend down that much, so I'll, I'll sit down. I don't like to sit down on that much. Okay, there we go. Is that better? Right. So, what, what is fusion? So, this comes from the rearrangement of nuclei into helium, and helium is the most stable of the lightest elements. This just comes from the rules of nuclear physics. Uh, so, it is interesting because it is often confusing to people also, what is this compared to nuclear energy or, or fission? Well, what happens in all of these is that the nuclei are rearranged and they go into more stable states, and this is the real re result of the, uh, of the energy release. But there, it's literally the opposite of, of fission, because instead of the disintegration of the largest, most unstable nuclei, um, it is actually the fusion of the lightest elements into, in, into helium. No, no, fine. Is it, is it, is it, I have to stay far. far. Oh, far, far. Now it's far. Okay. <laughs> Got more, it. Even more. Even more. How about how about this? Is this good? Is that good? Actually, it's better than it's not in my case. Too powerful voice. I'm yeah. sorry. I come from growing up on a farm and calling in the cows. I'm. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> and, yeah, okay. So what 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 is this? So uh, it is the opposite of, of fission. How, and how do you do this? Well, in fact, you start with the energy released per 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 um, per reaction. So this is this interesting unit MeV. What does this mean? Well, it's a, it's a unit of energy. But to put this into context. Uh, 10 to the minus 6 or 1 millionth of an MeV is the energy that's released in a typical chemical reaction when you burn natural gas or so forth. This is why it's such an attractive energy source because it has millions of times more amount of energy released per fuel. Uh, yet fusion is actually also, it's more mass efficient than fission because it's about five times larger than that. The big difference, one of the big differences, the threshold temperature is around 50 million degrees Celsius for fusion, and it's zero for neutron because it's done by a neutron. So it can happen at room temperature. The products which are released are helium, a stable light element, and a, and a free neutron. I'll talk about the neutron. In fission, you must, the energy ends up in hundreds of radioactive daughter isotopes, plutonium, gammas, neutrinos. This must occur because it's in the physics of fusion. Okay, so um, what is fusion energy? In the end, fusion energy is, is this picture that I showed you, but I'll walk you through it about how, how it works. So in the end, it's sustained by self-heating and recycled neutrons. We like recycling, right? This is a good, this is what it does. So let's talk about the energy balance. So the energy before is in this unit again of MeV. Remember, 10 to the minus six, one millionth of an MeV is, is around room temperature. Okay, so. What, what does this look like? Well, it's 0 0.01 and 0 0.01 for the fuel, for the de deuterium and tritium. It fuses together and releases 14.1 and 3.5. This is good from an energy point of view, very large energy gain. But this, this one, now to translate this into a fuel in the plasma state, this means that if it's at a temperature, it's 100 million degrees Celsius. That's what this energy over here. This means it must be in the plasma state, which is the fourth state of matter. Okay, so how do we work this? Well, what happened, where is this fusion energy? It's in the kinetic energy or the velocity of the particles. One fifth of the energy goes into the helium particle, which we see here. It has charge, therefore it is a part of the plasma. This energy then goes back into and heats 
the fuel, which is over here. So it's a cycle uh, simply through collisions which heats it. And helium, as I said, is the most stable of the light elements. So therefore, the helium cannot undergo any further reactions. So helium, unlike fission, does not use a chain reaction. It actually uses the heat, which comes from the fusion reaction itself. A very key difference and a fundamental one, which is very important. Right. And in fact, this was to put this into the context of the recent result. What happened in the, at the, in the laser fusion facility in California was that it showed that this process of the fact that the alphas, which is the, which is the physics name for the helium particles, increase the amount of fusion reactions. This is how a star works, because in the end, it's the fusion reactions which keep the fuel hot and which allow the next set of fusion reactions. This is a very important verification of how self-heating works, although it's not at fully yet at the point where it's dominating, actually, the heating, in part because of how laser fusion works. But that, that, hopefully that puts it into context. So it's a very exciting result, actually, for the fusion community. So how is it that now we turn to the particles? So very interesting, the neutron contains 80% of the fusion energy. This escapes the plasma because it has no electric charge. Therefore, it's not contained by the plasma. So again, it's at 14.1 MeV. And what happens to this? Well, it goes from 14.1 MeV to 0 0.03 times 10 to the minus 6 MeV, which is room temperature. So it comes back to room temperature and in, in the process gives up all its staggering amounts of energy into heat, into a thing which surrounds the fusion plasma. So it is this heat which produces electricity. So in the end, fusion is a heat source as an energy source. It is not some other, it, it's rather pedantic actually in this. So, and what does this mean? Well, the physics of the reactions of such a particle require then that this occurs in a solid or liquid phase because of the 10,000 times larger particle density in those phases as compared to gas. Okay, then the last thing that happens is that this neutron, when it comes to room temperature, we force it to interact with the lithium. And this is particularly lithium-6, which is the lightest of the stable forms of lithium. So this has a reaction which beautifully makes, what, a helium particle, it actually releases more energy, and it makes a tritium. And this tritium is then taken as a particle that actually goes back and is put back into the fuel cycle to supply this tritium. Because there is no terrestrial source of tritium at any significant rate because it has a short half-life. It decays away into helium-3 in 12, about 12 years. So this is very important because that tritium is then burned in the plasma. And if you can make the tritium per neutron greater than 1, which you can do, this closes the fuel cycle. And now if you notice, it's like, oh, I'm actually not using tritium as a fuel. The fuel or the consumable is deuterium and lithium. And deuterium and lithium, when you, when you release this amount of energy per atom, can sustain humanity's energy supplies forever. That's the promise of fusion because it comes from this science. And the ash particle, the waste particle, is helium. So this is why we get so excited about this as an energy source. So then there's some practicalities to this, like what does this neutron do? Well, it goes out and hits the surrounding material. It alters those materials. Well, the, in fact, your, your, your own subject of, uh, of investigation is that the plasma itself is a very interesting medium. It interacts with the surrounding surfaces and modifies them as well too. And you also deal with the fact that this occurs in a vacuum in a hard vacuum, and then there's ma these materials and other things which are around. In the end, fusion as an engineer, as a scientist, is also deeply multidisciplinary. It's not just plasma physics. It has to do with the entirety of all these challenges. So let's walk through it. So what does it actually require? So one of the key things that it actually requires is a confined thermonuclear plasma. What does this mean? So this has to do with the probability of the reaction. This is deuterium fusion. This is deuterium deuterium fusion. Why do we use deuterium tritium fusion? Well, it's because its probability is 100 times higher, actually, than, than the other reactions. This is another reaction, but close enough. And it occurs at energies here, which seem to be around 0.1 MeV. This is why I put up this number before. This means this is why it has to be in the plasma state, because ionization occurs you know, off the left-hand side of this plot. The other key part is that because it's in the plasma state, this means the particles bounce off each other through Coulomb interactions, which means that they interact through their electric field. 
If you come and take my class at MIT, we'll, I'll show you in about a week why this Coulomb cross-section must be larger always than the fusion cross-section. Why is this important? Because Coulomb scattering basically uh, shares the energy through scattering and not making fusion events. So fusion reactions have occurred in laboratories for 80 years. We have never made a net energy fusion system because you must contain all the particles at a temperature, which is why we call it thermonuclear plasmas, to be able to actually make net energy from the system. Otherwise, the energy just goes into scattering and heat and not into fusion reactions. And it's also then, in the end, far out of thermodynamic equilibrium in the terrestrial event. This means it needs confinement because it's at, sitting at a temperature of about 100 million degrees. So how do we do this? Well, we use, uh, this happens in stars and it happens by gravity because it happens by the gravitational force which holds this fuel in the center of stars. We can't use it because it needs something the size of a star for gravity to be that effective. So if you're also paying attention in your basic science classes, electromagnetic force is many orders of magnitude larger than the gravitational force. So what we do is we exploit the Lorentz force of the magnetic force. What does this do? This means that the particle has a charge times the velocity times the strength of the magnetic field. And this forces the charged particles in the plasma to execute circular orbits around the magnetic field. Why is this important? Oh, even even further away. Yeah. Okay, there we go. It, maybe I could stand up, actually. I don't know. I think yes. Oh, okay, very yeah. good. How about that? We'll put it up like this. Okay. So what happens is that the Lorentz force, um, what is, so it's proportional. So it turns out the charge and the velocity are fixed in fusion, but the force is larger when the magnetic field is larger. This will start to be a theme that you see. Um, and there's also no confinement parallel to the magnetic field because it comes through a cross. Okay, we said now it's too uh, now it's too late low uh, no, no. here i'll go back it's no 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 uh, i please everyone is <laughs> invited to switch off your yes. audio when you connect please help us thank you very much so <clears throat> there's no confinement along the direction of the magnetic field therefore you must close the magnetic field on itself and in the end, this magnetic field is produced by distant electromagnets, which are providing a force. This is also usually one of the most confusing things. How can you hold anything at 100 million degrees? It is not a physical container. It is a distance at a force which comes from this magnet. And the magnetic field is produced by an electromagnet, which has no physical contact with the plasma, because by the rules of electromagnetism, it can be very far away and not in contact with it. So what are the conditions necessary? Well, it looks like this. You must put density of a fuel together, you must have it hot enough, and you must have, you must arrange the logs in such a way that the energy stays within it. It's just that it has quite unusual conditions. We're all used to making a fire. The temperature must be around 100 million degrees, but the plasma density of fuel in magnetic fusion is 100,000 times less dense than the particle of density of air particles in this room right now. So these two things together make it a very unusual state. Oh, and by the way, this energy confinement time doesn't seem that large. It's one second. So that if you throw in a joule of energy, like you kind of wait till it comes out, if it's at about a second, that's going to be good enough. We've known about this since the 1950s. This gets a little bit more technical, but hold with me. So how do you do this? We actually, in the end, how you figure out how fusion works for all kinds of fusion is simply power balance because it has to do with the way that the fusion reactions heat the fuel that'll keep the plasma reactions going. So we have this, we have several concepts in this, the energy confinement time, which is simply defined as the energy content of the plasma divided by the power that is basically it's losing to be able to keep it hot. We also have the stored energy content, which just comes from the product of the density and the temperature. And then the fusion reactions themselves come from binary fusion reaction so it goes like the density of the fuel squared times a coefficient that comes from nuclear physics, which only depends on the temperature. So I'm going to skip a lot of math. We push these together, and then we also realize, oh, how this stays hot is the charged particles that come from fusion react, or sorry, bounce off of the cold plasma particles and basically do this. So in the end, it's really easy. You basically have a, a heating mechanism 
which is the fusion reactions, and you have a loss mechanism, which is basically the plasma losing its heat out, um, and you satisfy that power balance, et voila, you have, like, the wrong language, sorry, and then you have a, then you have a, uh, then you have a sustained fusion system, this is exactly how a star works as well, too. And up here, then, you see on these plots, you can do this for any combination of fusion fuel that you like, and you see that the minimum here is around 10 keV, this is 100 million degrees Celsius. Okay. But a few engineering points, very interesting. Again, temperature is very high, but the density is very, very low. So this makes it, this fuel is like 100 million degrees. The energy density is less than boiling water of the fuel because there's so few particles involved. Um, this thing about on the run, that the fusion, how do you control fusion power? Fusion control is in the end by plasma density because it's really the independent parameter that you have in this system. So this is controlled literally by puffing gas particles into a vacuum system. That's how you fuel a system. And in the end, the fusion reaction is sustained by heating, not a chain reaction, because you always want to operate near the optimization in temperature. This means runaway process for fusion power is physically impossible. Like it's you can't do it even if you even if you wanted to do it. Yeah. No, very interesting. So DT fusion power balance, how does this all work? Well, in realistic systems, we have a way of counting this. This is what we call this is capital Q sub P. And what this means is the fusion power out divided by, because on Earth, we know we're going to have to light the match. And the match means that we're going to have to put power onto the plasma. So what does this look like? Well, this means that when we have this heating power to the plasma, when we talk about a star, this is infinity. It's because the denominator goes to zero, and therefore it's just completely self-sustaining. But in a realistic fusion system, you would not do this. What you would do is actually get a QP of order of 10, because of, because of the conversion efficiencies involved, this actually would give you net Q electric so that you'd be able to power a plant to be able to make electricity onto the grid. So we look over here, how have we done historically? Well, very interestingly, we look, because people think fusion hasn't worked. It has worked. Right, so confinement times density on the vertical axis, temperature on the horizontal axis, particularly this crazy thing, 100 million degrees. These are data points. We've actually exceeded 100 million degrees in the laboratory in a confined thermonuclear plasma. Many of these happened actually more than 20 years ago. What we were not able to achieve was the product of the confinement and the density such that what? Well, it turns out, if you go through the math, is that it's just simply a correction on the, on the one that I showed you before. And you can draw all the curves that have to do with achieving this net energy gain. And they're only determined by these three parameters. We've got high enough temperature, but we have not pushed into the point where we'll actually get net energy from this. So in the end, why fusion energy? No polluting emissions because it just releases energy, essentially, in the end. Freely available and inexhaustible fuel supply. You can generate this anytime and anywhere. You do not have long-lived nuclear waste in the fuel cycle because it produces helium. Meltdowns are physically impossible. Um, and in the end, you can actually supply all of civilization's energy forever. So other than that, you know, it's not very attractive. Um, so, <clears throat> and, it, and really, a unique tool to tackle climate change but its problem was it was too slow to actual practical energy systems. It was not really in the mix, actually, even really three years ago, three or four years ago. And fusion had a conundrum, is that much of this science is so well understood. And how do we know this science is well understood? Is that we're building a very exciting science project called ITER in the south of France. Um, and you probably do research with us as well, too. And it was showing us that we were ready, to actually, to be able to turn on this new state when the plasma heats itself. Very exciting. But it was also proving to be rather large and slow. Like, it didn't look like it had great prospects for a practical energy system, even though the science was so great. At the same time, uh, very much, actually, in the UK and in the United States, there were companies they were coming out realizing there was so much demand for clean energy systems. They were willing to take f science risks because they, it, was, it was these points which were well below the blue points on my little plot. They did not have the science in hand yet about the containment of the plasma, but they were projecting to actually more practical, compact energy systems so we do that. So it was the advent really of private fusion which came. And so there was a question, can we have something that is fast, small, and inexpensive, and has actually no one's science around it? 
So the crime, you, you can, this is what you call leading the witness. I'm going to show you what the star looks like in the top right hand corner. So in 2016, uh, MIT Commonwealth made a plan to break the conundrum. And it was really a new opportunity that came from the ability to make the magnetic field with superconductors. I'm not going to go into the details of the superconductor, because it's been talked about before, but basically the old technology, LTS, low temperature superconductors, had features such that it required very low temperatures, but even more importantly, that if you tried to increase the magnetic field past a threshold level, it would not be a superconductor anymore, and this would disallow. So why do you need superconductors? Because you must produce the magnetic field not only at a distance, but with very little energy consumption. So high temperature superconductors, which became sort of quasi-commercial around 2015, had a feature that is for an engineer like almost uh, an unbelievable opportunity. Because in this operational space, not only of temperature, but also of the strength of the magnetic field. And the current density was approximately an increase in the operating volume of a factor of 1,000. And when you have an increase like that, all of a sudden, this means your engineering choices about how you actually access new territories for this technology were just completely opened up. So some of these are on different operating temperatures, some are on the strength of the magnetic field, and I'll show you what we did. So why is this so important? So there's a little bit more math in this. Okay. Why is the magnetic field so important? Well, remember I showed you before that the force is being exerted by the magnetic field and it's forcing the particles to undergo an orbit. The size of that orbit is only set by two things, the temperature of the, of the, of the, of the medium and the strength of the magnetic field. But this is actually fixed by that criteria that I just showed you before. So in the end, the only thing that really changes is the strength of the magnetic field. And when the strength of the magnetic field increases, the size of the orbit gets smaller. And therefore, in a dimensionless way, you fit more orbits into a smaller object, and you're still going to get the same confinement. So for this reason, and you're building three-dimensional objects, and you have a diffusive problem, I'm skipping over some math here, this means the cost scales like 1 over b cubed to 1 over b to the sixth, somewhere in between that. There's many debates about what the power law is actually is. The simplest one is the stabilization of the plasma. In the end, this fuel wants to push out, and the magnetic field is essentially a stabilizing force at a distance that literally exerts a pressure on the plasma. That scales like magnetic field squared. If you were paying attention before the plasma, the, the, the plasma pressure goes like the density squared, and therefore the plasma per the, sorry, the fusion power per unit volume. Uh, goes like the pressure squared, so in the end you win like b to the fourth power. This just comes from simple electromagnetic rules and, and, and how fusion works. So why is this all important? So doubling of the magnetic field produced by superconductors provides an approximately 20 to 40 fold improvement in cost per watt. Because it allows you to maintain large amounts of fusion power but decrease the size of the object. And that is, in cost per watt, is the is the first thing that you look at in a new energy source because it tells you about the economic viability of it. And a 20 to 40 fold improvement is a, is a major deal. And so how does this actually look? So this gives you a little bit more visuals of this. So this is the plot actually of the, on the vertical axis is the size of the device. You can also make fusion work by just making it bigger, but that is, doesn't improve very much its economic prospects. So you go up vertically on the axis, and then the horizontal axis is the strength of the magnetic field. These curves come from decades of, to of research on tokamax. We know how to draw these curves very accurately. And this is the gain increasing all the way up to factors of 20, which is basically what you'd use for a power plant. And so what we have is essentially a totally new pathway if we can get higher magnetic fields that make the devices much smaller and the end product of actually a fusion power plant also much smaller. How much smaller? Well, this is the device we had at MIT called Alcatraz CMOD that actually had absolute plasma performance very close to jet. It was at much higher magnetic field and it's 100 times smaller in volume than jet. Um, so we go forward, and here's Spark beside Eater at scale. You sort of get a visceral feeling of the differences of what happens when you can double the magnetic field. But it was more than just a technological innovation that was required. It was also an institutional or organizational innovation. So we looked at this opportunity and realized that if the pressing need was really around climate change, we also needed a way to basically translate 
these ideas into the marketplace as fast as possible. And so what we did was we came from a traditional laboratory uh, at MIT that, that studied plasma containment and so forth. And we decided we, if we were going to speed up the commercialization, we needed to develop the commercial entity ourselves. So we spun out a company, Commonwealth Fusion Systems. We raised around $200 million at the beginning of this. Thank you, E&I, for your very early support of this, but also support from other people in the world who care about clean energy with the idea that the company could grow while we at MIT supported the innovations in science and technology that were needed to build to grow this up together and do what? Basically, take this magnet technology, this new superconductor technology, make a new type of magnet, then build a device that would make net energy, and then race towards commercialization in a device called ARC. So we also had a new model for commercialization because it coupled uh, a leading research university with a private company. Why did this work? Well, we leveraged you know approximately a billion dollars of government-sponsored infrastructure at MIT. That we were able to put people together to work side by side, both at the uh, in the company and at MIT, including students as well too. And our tech transfer was as fast as possible because the teams that worked together were actually able to then, once it became repetitive and commercial, that team left MIT and is starting to do that. And we're literally doing that. I'll show you the example of this. And this gets through this so-called valley of death as fast as possible for new technologies. So what did we do? So some nice pictures. So I cleared out the biggest uh, hall at, at MIT, um, and what we did was we installed a world-class uh, testing capability for this new superconducting magnet uh, facility, which include large current supplies, uh, new types of cryogenics. I could give an entire talk just on the new technology and the magnets, but uh, I, I, won't, I won't have time for this. And in the end, there you see it. See the people around, the, the magnet is actually in the center, which you see there. Um, and this is the kind of test facility that you would make at a university because it's, it's very good for testing out that. Something like 300 instruments involved in this. So what did we do? So we built this in under three years. We built and tested this non-insulated high field magnet needed for this mission that I just showed you, which was the aspiration, which was to double the magnetic field that you could make in superconducting coils and therefore be able to bring this towards fusion commercialization. So it's fully representative of the spark coil operation, including the heating technology, or sorry, the cooling technology, the level of current, the local stresses, and so forth. Uh, uh, for those who are mechanical engineering uh, faculty and students, the peak stresses in this coil were over 900 megapascal uh, at peak field. It's hard to build high field coils because of the Lorentz force. Um, the particular one is that it's non-insulated, so this means that there are no high voltages possible inside of the coil. And to me, probably the most important one, it was highly modularized. It's actually built of 16 subcomponents, which themselves are the largest high temperature supercomputing magnets ever made. And then we figure out the technology about how to put them together. Why is this important? This is for assembly, maintenance, uh, and QA as you're actually building these there's a completely different model for building high temperature superconductors, which in the end is so important uh, for commercialization. And that was successfully tested September 5th, 2021. What did it look like? The first test that we did, and there's more tests going on now, but it basically verified everything about the steady state coil performance at 20 Tesla. The internal, very, the internal region of the coil, in fact, this entire region here in red was over like 19 Tesla. The peak field was actually more like 22 Tesla inside of the coil, and basically nothing happened. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was really good. Uh, but, but it was a real experiment, full levels of instrumentation, of voltage taps, and in the end we actually also validated probably the most sophisticated electromagnetic computer model ever made for magnets, because in many ways the magnet itself is self-determined because it's not insulated and therefore the current essentially self-determines where it goes inside of this. And there was a very interesting superconducting magnet. It's a, good, it's a good question. Maybe one of the students can take this on. Why does it take uh, 20 hours to uh, charge a superconducting magnet? Think about your basic electromagnetism there. So there, on we go. So what does it look like? What this really is, it's about a plan, not just to do cool science and magnets, it's a cool about putting fusion energy on the grid. And what does this look like? Well, it looks like we had the high field science that came from the, 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 the tokamak we ran at MIT. We actually completed this new magnet, and then we announced, uh, the, the, the company announced $1.8 billion of funding 
to be able to go do what? Well, to build Spark. Spark is the demonstration of net energy. I'll talk about that in a minute. And what's the timeline around 2025? Because we've built many token max of this size in the world already. And then the idea is to get going towards commercial fusion in the early 2030s by scaling up this. But by the way, the magnet technology in ARC, which is what we call this one, is the same as it is in Spark as it is in the one we just showed last September. That was the key link of what was needed. So what is this? So Spark, when I say it provides the Kitty Hawk moment for fusion. So you're familiar with Kitty Hawk. No one had flown something that weighed, that was heavier than air, and then you did. And then you know, you can fly. So Spark, you know, the Kitty Hawk flyer was not, a, was not a commercial airliner, but you know you can fly, right? And so what is this? It, it has a many things stripped away from it, actually, so it can show that fusion can make energy. Here's the device using that magnet technology. You can see how compact it is. This will produce 100 million watts of fusion power and plasma energy gain greater than 10. So this means the amount of fusion power will exceed the amount of heating power being coupled to the plasma. This is, again, to show that fusion can fly, but provide access to completely new science. Why is this? Well, it's because at Q of 10, this means, and if you, if you remember the math of this, one fifth of the fusion energy goes to heating the plasma. This means there's double the amount of internal heating as compared to external heating. So we've lit the match, we've, the, the, the bonfire is burning, and we've never seen that actually in a plasma. So this coupled to it. Yet, it doesn't, it's, an, it's not just the study burning plasmas, it's always in a commercial context, because the idea of it is can we prove the economic basis to go forward to ARC? Oh, um, and then why was this magnetic field so important? So this is a simple extrapolation which shows the curve of what gain you can get. And the, and the old superconducting te technology, the one that was in, that's been, being used in ITER, which is itself a difficult technology, uh, basically showed that in this kind of size device, you can never get the high gain in this if you had that previous, which was around 11 Tesla or something like this. With 20 Tesla, you can see this curve gets very steep, and our projection right now is that it would in fact have 11 for, for the gain. So now in red, I put, why was this result at JET so important? It's, it wasn't just important for this, but this is one of the examples. So one of the ways we know this is going to work by, is by doing wind tunnel type experiments with present tokamax. And therefore what we do is we, we note the relative, these are normalized things of pressure, normalized ion radius, normalized collision rate, and so forth. And this comes from all of those tokamax we've built around the world in these gray points, which are scattered around with this. And then on the vertical axis, is the confinement quality, which tells us about whether or not we'll actually get that one second of energy confinement time. So what we can see is that spark, which is this big green dot in the middle of this, actually is in very much in the middle of the cloud of all of this. Why are we so excited about the jet result? Because the jet result are these, or actually these were previous jet results, but this reconfirmed it in deuterium tritium, are these red points. And what you can see is that spark is very much in the middle, in fact, of those data points. This gives us a very much high science and why we are very excited to see the jet result as well too. So where is this? So this is it's being built right now. This is 45 minutes northwest of Boston. I talked about fast tech transfer. This is the magnet assembly building. It's literally the same teams that worked alongside the MIT people are now constructing this building. And by the summer, we will have the ability to start constructing the magnets. So just a few quick topics. So it's in, there will be much research on Spark, and I'm going to complete my talk soon by going to the power plant. But Spark itself has, just like Eater, has very, very important ones, but a slightly different context than Eater because this is all about rushing towards commercialization. So it's really, really informed by economics. So what do I mean by this? So we're going to study self-heated plasma for the first time. This means that we're going to do, we're going to look at energy gain in, 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 the, in, the, in the device, which is so important for commercialization. However, we're doing it without intentional energy extraction in the system, because it makes it much faster to do that. And the boundary plasma, your own area of, of topics, is that we are going to have the power density of a fusion power plant. But we're going to do this without active cooling, because it gives us the ability to explore that. And we're going to look at transients, and because this tells us about the reliability or availability of these systems in the end. However, we're not going to do this with long pulses so we can avoid the engineering complexities that come with this. So an incredibly exciting research platform, but insufficient to get there because what we really want to get to is ARC. 
An ARC is a commercial power plant with the idea that it would produce commercial scale fusion electricity on the grid. Uh, and there's only a few boundary conditions to this. So what is it? Well, it's actually the only boundary conditions on this is that really it's going to use this new magnet technology because that is the sine qua non, is right? Is you must have this to be able to make the device much smaller, and it has that. Um, so what does this mean? It leads to, in fact, and the other thing that we're excited about the jet result is that that is uh, arc is at the size of jet. They're almost identical in physical dimension. We know how to build those. We've built them before and we've operated them. But the increase in magnetic field by a factor of approximately three, and remember B to the fourth power, th this is going to give you the power now to actually go way past, and this is why it produces so much more fusion power on exactly the same physics as what was established there. The other point is that we're going to use a liquid immersion blanket. Remember the neutrons, they can have to interact in solids or liquids. We choose a liquid for some good, that, that'll be good for questions probably. Um, and in the end, it's a modularized design, which means that the wearable components must be able to be replaced. But what's most important is it's really set, it's interesting as an academic, I want to do really cool research and push the frontier. But working alongside a company is we understand is that what we have to do is always have in mind, not, not some cool plasma physics phenomena or some other thing. We must keep one thing in mind, economics, because I don't think it's science anymore that's holding back fusion. It's actually economics. Um, and this is what we got to concentrate. So what does this mean? We need to keep innovating in the technology. That's really one of my one. And this actually arc itself is a platform for looking at that technology. So the way I look at it, to accelerate fusion, which we need, you know, it's one of the only things that we can extrapolate, you know, to really tackle climate change, we need to start working now, not, not after Spark, like now on this, in parallel with Spark, with the idea that we've got, we've got a good idea of the, hmm, I would say almost like the cartoon of what this has to look like. And the economics are pretty clear because we have a, a very established energy markets. But what will the details of this technology look like inside of this? So how would it work? So actually, let's get to ARC. So you re recognize this also, it's, a, it's, it's another magnetic donut, basically, which is round. Again, the magnetic fields, coils are there. Well, actually, let's, let's walk through it. So these high field electromagnets confine the 100 million degree plasma, which is shown in orange there. This is the same as what we're talking about now. The same physics parameters as in SPARC actually identical to this. So then the plasma creates fusion reactions on order of 500 million watts of fusion power. In fact, you can go higher than that, but that's what we look at. Then what happens is that those, this is now a more engineering uh, uh, drawing of what happens, then that, that fusion power comes out and interacts with this bluish medium, which is round. This is a high temperature salt, uh, molten salt, which actually captures the, the fusion energy. And then after this, the heat of this, which is put into that salt, is removed out of the system, and in this case, makes electricity. So you can see outside of like the, 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 the magnetic coils, it's not a very exotic looking power system at all. It's basically a heat system. And in the end, a heat system is, this is what we want because it's adaptable into our power grid. But the challenges to fusion economics are mostly around engineering aspects. It's, it's not that the physics of confinement is all done. Spark will be an incredibly important aspect of verifying those physics. But let's, let's take a look at these. Um, these high field electromagnets, well, you're gonna to have to build a lot of them. Like how many power plants of these are you gonna to have to build to take you on climate change? Thousands. Uh, but we can do things at this scale, right? It's like building airplanes almost. But these magnets must be modular, they must be highly reliable, you must have inexpensive manufacturing methodologies. There's really like process engineering, mechanical engineering comes to this. Then the plasma creates fusion reactions, right? Okay, so what, what about here? Well, besides the plasma scenarios, which are really going to be looked at really in Spark, in some sense in ITER as well too, internal heat transfer. I mean, wow, it's fantastic. We've increased the fusion power density by a factor of 16. It's like, oh, wow. This means more heat wants to get out. It's like, well, yeah, and every jewel that you leave behind in inefficiency and so forth is bad for economics. How do we innovate in heat transfer? And then around the molten salt, great. It works great in many ways, but we have to tackle corrosion in a high temperature salt environment, fuel recovery, materials in this. And in the end, the heat is extracted like a normal thermal power plant. Oh, by the way, we're not just doing heat transfer, we're also doing it in a high magnetic field. Oh. 
Oh, and materials. Yes, there are these internal materials get very modified actually by this intense environment. So that's the overall cartoon. How am I doing on time? I just got a few more slides. Yeah, yeah, yeah a couple more slides. So I just wanted to tell you, it's like, so this is starting like now. Like we don't have all the the pieces in place right now, but what's happening at, at my own institution is that I have a, a lot of students, things which are coming to work on the plasma, the containment science, the things which will come from Spark, which are absolutely ne necessary, but really in many ways, to me, set the boundary conditions for the great next challenge. And the great next challenge is in, this te in, in these technology innovations. I'll show you a couple examples of what we're working on. So one of them is, um, is actually to look at this salt, which is, surrounds the fusion plasma and interacts with the fusion products. So what we're going to do is basically produce a mini blanket, which is what we call this thing with, that surrounds it. And it's going to use DT neutrons, which come from an accelerator source. Now, this can never make net energy, but what it does is it recreates the conditions for the salt chemistry and so forth, which are there with the idea. So this is about a large garbage can based thing of salt. Um, and what we're going to do is really see if we can close the fuel cycle. So the tritium breeding ratio being greater than one, even at a small scale, will be an indication of that. Other, remember, we need two things, heat recycling and particle recycling. We've never shown particle recycling at any scale in the laboratory. So hopefully at the end of this, we now then have a, a, a very good handle on tritium extraction corrosion control. But what's interesting is that there are many opportunities for collaboration and research because this area is outside of the traditional areas where fusion research has occurred. There's almost all been about the plasma and even the plasma material interaction. This is like hardcore chemical engineering, nuclear engineering, material science and engineering, corrosion control, control and so forth, but so critical yet in the context of what we're doing going forward. Or what about the materials? One of the new ideas is that we actually, uh, it's very difficult because the neutrons are very disordering to the, to the matter. But we have, we have no ME, 14 MeV neutron source of any consequence because you need a fusion power plant to do this. So this seems like a so-called catch-22. So one of the things that we're working on, my, my more junior colleagues at, at MIT, we're working on a new idea that uses so-called intermediate energy protons. These protons are above 10 MeV in energy. Uh, and for this reason, uh, I won't go through the nuclear physics of this, this basically means they become a much better proxy for the damage which comes from neutrons. Uh, and you can do tests on material samples, on real material samples that give you real engineering um, things like pull tests and so forth. Um, so, uh, and this, I, I love the symmetry of these. And why is this possible? Why weren't people thinking about this before? Because there weren't good enough superconductors to build the cyclotrons and there's the cyclotron that's built with last generation superconductors, but it's, it can be run by graduate students. And so we're starting now on a program that we consider how would you use this new tool to get very high throughput, although it's not an exact match to what you would get in a fusion device. Our throughput, I would estimate, would be 100 to 1,000 times faster per sample than if we were to try to do this with neutrons. And so this is the kind of example of it should be good enough, but not necessarily perfect to get going towards industrial scale testing. And then finally, the last one, and here again, I must acknowledge our supporters at ENI as well too, uh, on this, which was around this idea of, of heat transfer. And again, I'll point out, this is, in my mind, the one that sits out there that I don't really know the answer to, to this. Uh, and it's because in the end, it's this heat transfer through these internal surfaces, which will almost certainly be the limiting factors to how much power you, you can make in these devices. With these new magnets in place, uh, we can make much larger amounts of power. We have no solution to actually pull out the power in a way that is consistent with essentially the physical limits of the internal systems of the surface that's being pulled through. So what is this like? Well, it's like we're pulling out two megawatts per square meter. To put this in context, that's about one-tenth of the surface of the heat flux at the surface of the sun. It's like very intense amounts of heat flux. The problem is we face these challenges of the fact that we want to make these internal objects very thin to support heat conduction and heat losses, but we need to make them at some level of strength because they're in a very large electromagnetic field and therefore they can be, many forces can be induced on those. So in many ways it's like a, it's, it's an engineering problem because these things always compete against each other. So one of the projects that we're working on right now is so-called, we call the liquid sandwich vacuum vessel. 
is we try something totally different. It's, it's, it's kind of out there, but it's really different. The idea is we, re we replace most of the vacuum boundary as not a solid material, but as a liquid material, which is trapped between two pieces of solid material. And our idea is to use silicon carbide on this, which is difficult as well too. But in the end, what this has is an ability to keep the heat transfer medium thin, but it actually still has large structural support because what we're doing is we're forcing by some level of cleverness that we still haven't all figured out, basically these tr forces to, to work on a liquid rather than a solid, and therefore, you know, you, you can't basically break a liquid. And that's in the end what it does, but yet it still supports heat conduction. This is an ongoing project, very, very exciting. Um, actually, we're looking for collaborators on this as well, too. So anyway, I'll go to here. So I'll conclude with this. I hope you understand, like, why we're excited about fusion. It's not just our endeavor, by the way. There is... There are something like 20 private, over 20 now, I think, private sector fusion companies. And yes, some of them have more speculative, speculative physics. You can see our approach is really one where, while it's rooted in really strong science, we need continued technological innovations. But this is in front of us. Like, this magnet technology means this is in front of us. Like, can, can we solve these integrated, like build Spark, get this answer about fusion energy gain, but can we collectively solve these other kinds of problems to make really fusion a practical energy source that we can deploy in the next decade? If we can do that, we have given ourselves an incredible new tool against climate change. So thank you. Thank you very much, Professor White, for this very rich talk, starting from the very basics of nuclear fusion and coming to one of the most, I mean, also interesting and uh, maybe also debated directions. So the timeline in order to arrive at the goal uh, to produce fusion energy and having it available. So we have time for sure to discuss with you. I have already several questions in the chat that we propose to try to one question here and one from the audience remotely. So we start asking whether anyone would like to start breaking the eyes with a question. Just raise your hands. So I see a couple of here. We can start over there. And if you agree, let's try one and one to be democratic also with the remotely connected up to the time we will have. Okay, yeah, thank you for the very, very nice talk and uh, your passion and enthusiasm, I think was clear, at least to me, but I guess to all the audience, so really thank you. Uh, well, one of the fact, um, of not so nice fact of uh, making your reactor small is that the flux of neutrons to the superconductor is higher. So, uh, how much is already known about uh, neutron damaging? You mentioned that there will be a devoted, dedicated facility to this topic, but in your opinion, uh, could it be like a major obstacle toward the, the goal? Thank you. Yeah, so, so, so if I may complement, so I will skip one question that could be. So there are some parameters which scales with the size of the machine. And yes. another one is the energy confinement time. Yes. So maybe you can make comments about that point, yeah. and this one would be very it's, per it's perfect. So one thing that does not scale with the magnetic field is the length that the neutron goes and to, to interact and basically deposits its energy. To get a little more technical, so what do you have to do to the neutron? You must moderate it. You must, you must come back down to thermal temperatures to react to the lithium, as I showed. So this can, by, because it's a stochastic process, this means you can never do this perfectly. And so there's always very small fractions of the neutrons which can leak out of this and then interact with the things and this also has to do with the secondary um, radiation products which come from this so this is this was um in fact are you a student well, I'm a researcher. Researcher, that's us. Yeah. But, um, so this is why, when we came to do this uh, this design, which came from a student class uh, in the beginning uh, at, at MIT, the key question to me wasn't, can we make high magnetic field? We, th we thought, oh, probably we can do it. I didn't know, really, how small we can make it. And in the end, the use of the liquid, the, the particular salt that we use, comes from 
the fact that you know, the science of the mod moderation of the neutron means you must put light elements continuously in front of the neutron. Because if you try to fit, for example, a standard uh, blanket, uh, for example, if you try to fit the eater blanket shield modules into this, it will not work. And the, the thing immediately grows in size because you need that physical space to do it. So this is what we call coupled you know, technological and science innovation. The science tells you, make it from a liquid and make it from light elements of liquids. And you can show fairly quickly that it actually shrinks the size of the blanket by about a factor of two. And you still get sufficient shielding as, as, as best we can tell. Now, to your, the other question is, do we actually know the details of how long the high temperature superconducting materials will last in the neutron field. We do not know the answers to all of the details of this, but we have a good approximation for this that approximately this size w w will work. And so what we need to know is, this then goes into all of the, the, the nitty gritty details, because in nuclear engineering like this, centimeters matter to the, to the thickness of this. But we think that there is a viable pathway actually to do this, but we are starting now the experiments uh, to be able to answer that question as to exactly what does the shielding need to look like to guarantee the lifetime of the power plant for you know, well over 30 years for the magnets. Thank you. One question from the chat. In a high power small fusion device, which methods are being studied for power exhausted and diverter? Yeah. Such a small volume. Yeah. Volume? So, um, so I'll, start, I'll start with ARC, um, so out here which is, you can see this rather strange shape. Um, most of these plasmas have a large D shape. Like you see, this is where the fusion occurs. Um, so why have we, again, uh, inspired by, uh, by where we, we did this in one of the fusion uh, classes that I teach? Because it was clear once we had done the first arc design, what was, what was not there was a diverter solution. It was the diverter. The diverter is a location where we intentionally siphon off the magnetic field, the confined magnetic field, and force it into to hit onto materials. This comes for a variety of reasons, but in the end, it actually concentrates the heat flux uh, in these regions. It's primarily to actually exhaust the particles out of the the, the helium ash actually out of the out, out of the plasma. So we looked, and this was an interesting one because it turned out the flexibility of the liquid immersion blanket, which was all this other stuff around, turned out to be a key component, in fact, to this is that it seemed that if we could make an extra long leg, like this is a very long leg, like how, do we, how are we able to accomplish this? We were able to accomplish this because, first of all, the plasma control was much better because the, the salt has very low electrical conductivity and therefore the magnetic control of the plasma is much better because the, the penetration time for the magnetic field is 50 times faster than in a standard blanket. That was one. The second one is that the moderation to the neutrons produced by the fly actually reduced the neutron damage rate at the diverter because, we, because of the geometric situation. So this improved the materials prospect. And then in the end, this long leg that we have out here, which right now through models alone, because we, we don't have an experiment of this, the models tell us that this will enforce or force the plasma at the end of this where it wants to touch the surface to get very, very cold. And if you can do this, then not only does it reduce the heat flux, but it also um, takes away the, uh, it, it, it or doesn't eliminate, but it, it drastically reduces the amount of erosion that the material, that the plasma will have of this material. So this is one of these examples of, it's actually not really the diverter design, it's in many ways the integrated other parts of the technological design really took you to a different place. And by the way, it was interesting, everybody knew that these kinds of configurations were not possible in fusion devices because you can't actually make this magnetic topology unless you had these new magnets because these new magnets allowed us to put internal high temperature superconducting uh, magnets inside of us to be able to do this. So this is always the fascinating part, I mean, just speaking at a higher level, this is the fascinating part of why fusion is such a hard problem. There's almost no part of the design that does not some affect some other part of the design in, in these. Um, and there's, there, there, I have, I have, there's a new pathway that we have uh, that we haven't fully explored, but it appears another possibility is for the heat exhaust is to actually turn off the diverter. And that's a whole other t talk, which I'm happy to, <laughs> to, to discuss. And the way you turn off the diverter is you intentionally leak the power from the very boundary of the plasma because the magnetic field gives you so much more margin about achieving the net energy gain that um, uh, the diverter no longer becomes a large sink 
for the heat. So that, that's a long-winded explanation. But it is, it is absolutely necessary. All I point out is that this is why you must do it this way. I'll, 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 I'll counter an example, because I know this is often uh, a criticism from my fusion colleagues, the fusion power density is too high. If the fusion power density is not high, you don't have a power plant. I'm sorry, you will never compete. Because fusion power density, the fuel is free, by the way. So for the amount of power that you make per unit volume, if it doesn't get very high, it will never be a competitive energy source. It's barely competitive even with this advanced design. So if we don't figure out a way to make it high power density, then let's go use some other energy source. <laughs> other question that was a hand raised over there. So meanwhile, I will take advantage of these seconds to thank all those supporting the organization uh, for today's event. Uh, besides, I will start with Elena. You, you can see oh, the PhD student here at Politecnico Milano, but also Valentina Esdonia Tagliavini and the, the others uh, who in these few days, uh, besides, I mean, the stimulus by any made this event possible. Please. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you very much for your very, very interesting and inspiring talk. And um, my question is, does the increase in the magnetic field also have side effects, well, positive or negative side effects, related to plasma stability? And would it, for example, allow to avoid some uh, specifically designed systems that are present in today's tokamaks to uh, handle and to improve plasma stability? Yeah, great question. Yes. So the um, so what, what, what's being mentioned is that so in these fusion plasmas, sort of like solar flares can pop up. They're basically internal instabilities and they're of different magnitudes. And when these instabilities pop up, they can damage the interior surfaces of the materials of the components because they're, they're, not, they're not a general safety hazard, but they are, uh, they can affect the performance and the damage on the surfaces of the internal components. So, so we worry about these. Um, so the high magnetic field is very, very important to this. Um, and in fact, ARC, it was, which is an acronym, which stood for Affordable, Robust, Compact. The robustness comes from the fact that you can use the magnetic, the magnetic field that's being generated is largely a stabilizing magnetic field. And therefore, what happens is that we move the operating point further away from, from these transient limits. So this includes the, the beta limit, which is the pressure limit. It includes the density limit, which is essentially the fueling limit. We move those further away, and this then allows actually the, the device to operate with high fusion power density, yet more stability. And those trade-offs that you play within the scenarios of what you do. So, um, yes, and that's going to be a key part of looking at Spark because it's going to have for the first time the magnetic field that Arc will have, and we'll be able to look at that in an integrated way. Okay. So we have so many questions. I will try ask Dennis maybe to to try answer shortly to some further of them. I will pick up another one in the chat. Uh, so what about the positive test done in China and UK in the fusion? Which are the differences? So I guess that in China they are talking about the East results in which uh, yeah. the superconducting coils. Yeah, the simple the simple answer is so. In one, you need energy content, and this is this is what the jet one did. And then because they use copper coils, they cannot sustain the plasma for very long, also the way that they did it. So that was a very important one because it's energy content. The ones that were going on in China are about the duration of the plasma. Uh, so it has much lower uh, power, uh, fusion power, but it was being done for much longer periods of time. In fact, uh, long enough that the uh, there was thermal equilibrium obtained for the internal components. So that's why both of those are important. Do we have another question or comment over here from the audience, please? Uh, I appreciate your approach of, of uh, looking into the economy, economy of the, the system, the reliability for commercial. I wonder if the tokamak is the really uh, good confinement to reach uh, uh, fusion, because reducing the cost of magnet is essential. But there is a point that uh, the so-called confinement efficient, efficiency of the tokamak is, is low. We talk about 3-4%, I mean the intensity of uh, the plasma energy versus the intensity of energy of the magnetic field. Mm -hmm. Whereas there are other systems which uh, had efficiency much higher, 0 0.7, 0 0.8. 
I refer, for example, also to the poloidal confinement, which you investigated uh, in recent year, in, also in, in MIT, reinvented with su superconducting mm -hmm. magnet, the LDX experiment. And I wonder why we, you have not continued on that way, which would allow to achieve a fusion reactor with a magnetic field of the order of two or three tesla only. Yeah, right. So, uh, so the way I would say it is that, so the, in, in a way, our thought experiment is what device would you build if the magnetic field is free? And, it's in, and when it's in a superconducting state, the magnetic field is free with the superconducting because it doesn't consume any significant amount of power. Now, you have to build it, right? But that, and then that's the cost that comes into the economics of it. Um, so yes, so many of those other ones are attractive from a theoretical point of view, but in, in, as I showed, showed in the, the, the Lawson criterion, I mean, in the end, it comes down to the Lawson criterion, I mean, the, which is this, just wait here, oh, which is this plot, which I show here, is that it's, um, even stellar readers are not actually close to the tokamak right now. So if you want speed, then our, our judgment was we pick a science that we know and add in this new technology. I mean, um, and these other ones are, um, they, have, they have a lot of physics to actually get through because they have to get to the right plasma state, the right collisionality, and all these things you talk about, uh, high, you're basically talking about high beta devices where you can get those conditions. But, I mean, we ran those experiments and they weren't as good as a tokamak. I mean, kind of not even close, really. I mean, even the Stellarator is still a factor of 5 to 10 away in confinement. And it's basically the same concept as a tokamak, just with different shaped magnetic coils. So my, my view of it is that the, it's really important that we, we, we get something to work and make fusion relevant to the energy economy. And, but it's not to say that there, will be other, there won't be other versions of this that come along. And I'll actually point to the Stellarators, if I can use that as the example, is that the Stellarator concept itself will greatly benefit from this new magnet technology. But its science isn't as mature as it is now. So as we go forward, it's almost, um, I, I like to use analogies from other industries. And I think this, as I said, we're kind of looking at the right flyer and we're trying to guess what a Dreamliner looks like, or a Hercules transport plane for military, or a you know a fighter jet. We don't know what those things <laughs> look like. The market will dictate those things, but it is for sure true that you got to meet those physical conditions. And in the end, the economics are the things that, that will actually will drive this. So I, I'm I'm very happy that people are trying these other ones. And I think to me the opportunity is in the synergies that come when you actually allow the technology innovations to actually bootstrap yourself up towards these things. If we have four different kinds of fusion power plants, fantastic. So I think that with this, we also answer the question in the chat. Is it, it's not worth to verify the new superconductive confining mining to the Stellarator approach uh, and so forth. So Absolutely. Oh, I would love to this. see a high temperature superconducting Stellarator. This would be fantastic. And in fact, there are private companies yeah, which are looking at this right now as Renaissance we speak. Renaissance Fusion is one of them. Renaissance Fusion. There's a company. There's something called Type One Energy in the United yeah. States. Well, there, there's a reason why you're seeing this proliferation of the private sector companies. It's because this is what happens at the beginnings of these these things. Is I, I'll I, I'm sorry to you know th this looks very much like the beginnings of things like the genetics re revolution when people looked at this and everyone knew it was going to take 30 years to sequence the human genome. And then all of a sudden it happened in one and a half years because a technological innovation came along. Was that the end of it? That was the beginning of things. Like my own laboratory at MIT, we have a hard time finding office space because there's all biogenetics companies like going up all over the place. This is what it looks like, yeah. So to combine on this, another question in the chat, you can have a chance to comment about, do you think that inertial confinement is a serious competitor in this story? So basically you just talk about magnetic yeah. Fusion. Well, well, certainly the result from NIF, which was a very exciting one of seeing high amounts of self-heating, was an important um, breakthrough for that for that field. Um, and I have I, at my own center, we have people who work on, in this. So, from the, here's how I would say: is that I don't think it's as ready for prime time as magnetic fusion. And the, uh, I'll only go to all the reasons uh, for this. It's actually explained in many reports. But some of it has to do with the transit nature of the energy release 
and so and, and so forth. Um, but what's lacking right now is that it kind of needs the equivalent of what is the magnet, what, 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 what we do in the magnet, we kind of need it for the drivers. Like there needs to be a technological breakthrough, which allows us to see a much more efficient, compact ability to provide the underlying pulse of energy to the ablators such that it would extrapolate the economic power source. And then there's a whole bunch of other problems to solve. Like for example, the target fabrication, the first wall problem, these are all problems in inertial fusion. But if we can get there, and there's some people who are starting to think of, about that too, which is like next generation lasers, which would get us to the point, then we'd be there. But I'd say right now, probably the mag magnet fusion is, is ahead. By the way, the private sector is kind of voting with this. It's like, you know, this, what is it? 95% of them are, are about magnetic fusion. Yeah, yeah. even if private companies are related to inertial fusions, yeah, yeah. they already exist, right? Yeah. yeah. Other questions or comments? in the room. I think we can go on still maybe five minutes. Okay, ah, I'll pick up another one. In, I have many of them in the chat. Okay, very good. Yeah. <laughs> See, this is good. This is what happens, by the way, if you grow up and be a professor, then you get to answer questions. Okay, I will take this one because there is someone writing it. There is something fundamental missing in the talk. Okay. May I ask about this? Uh, so since it is S, S I don't know. Yeah, What's your name? But you can take, you can open your microphone if you like. You can make the comment or the question. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's Stefan. So the fundamental. Uh, thanks for your for your talk, and uh, of course um, we all wish you um, all the best on your quest and with this project. But the fundamental thing which I was missing, um, uh, so maybe I missed it privately or you didn't uh, talk about it, is um, <clears throat> let's say if you work with a tokamak, of course you need the um, the second component of the magnetic field, which is, let's say, the colloidal magnetic field. You were talking about the toroidal magnetic field component um, and the work with the, with, the, with the coils, the new type of coils. So how would you want to sustain um, the colloidal magnetic field and on uh, for how long and, um, and how do you want to achieve that um, to uh, go to a future power plant? In a sense, capital Q can be 10, can be 100 if you just can't... Yeah. If you just can't sustain it for microseconds or milliseconds, and then you need uh, two days again to get for milliseconds, um, it will never be a fusion power plant. So these yep. are really my fundamental questions. Thank yep. you. Um, so, right. So I'll have to get a little bit more. So he, he was asking about the fact that you need more than one kind of magnetic field in the tokamak, which is technically true. I just skipped over it for the. So um, uh, how do you do? So in the end. What you actually have to have is a is a uh, uh, is a is a magnetic field configuration that goes the long my my fingers are the magnetic field that goes around around the long way but also goes around the short way. So in fact, in the end, it looks like a, a twisted barber pole in a, a thing which goes uh, around like this. Um, and so this other aspect of the magnetic field is the so-called poloidal field. It's it's actually the field that is really doing the confinement. The, the, the big field is does mostly does the stabilization, provides the gyre radius size. So all of this said is that, so how do we provide the poloidal field? It's actually in, in these systems. So um, the poloidal field is made by other uh, another type of, of magnet, which is, which is still based on the Rebco uh, magnetic field coils. So we have not actually done those tests. They're in process probably literally, well, it's probably too, maybe too early in Boston, but almost literally right now. So we are, we because the hardest challenge was the large DC ones because of the high magnetic field, um, the next generation of the tests will in fact be on these others. And the challenge of them is that they're, uh, they're not DC, they're, they're actually changing in time because they change in time with respect to either providing the flux swing, which prov provides the induction, which actually sustains the plasma current, or they are used to, to produce, in fact, these uh, things that were asked about, the magnetic field, the topology, and so forth, are changed by external coils. But they're in a magnetic field, which tends to be about 10 times less than the magnetic field, which are produced by the, by, by the TF coil, uh, by, by these large coils. So in the end, what does this extrapolate to? Is that spark turns on, um, uh, it's confined primarily by that big magnetic field, as I pointed out. It's got these other ones, which and those will be relevant to the to arc. Uh, but we only turn it on for about ten seconds at a time, 
Uh, and that, 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 that's the word spark, by the way, which denotes that it's going to be on for a short period of time. Why is this important? Because it turns out that the longest time scale involved, sort of to your question, uh, uh, to, the, to the question that came from the, from the audience, was that what does, what does uh, uh, steady state look like in a plasma? Well, the longest time scale turns out to be the evolution of the magnetic soaking in of this poloidal magnetic field in the system. And because the plasma is very hot, uh, it's a very good conductor, it actually almost acts a little bit like a superconductor. And so the magnetic field takes a very long time to evolve. And in spark, that turns out to be around three seconds. And so once you're past a few threes of seconds, then the plasma doesn't know. It's essentially, to the plasma physics, it's in full equilibrium as it will be to eternity. So for this reason, and to make the engineering more simpler in Spark, this turns on for 10 seconds. Um, and, but at that point, you are satisfied it's essentially like the right flyer. You know that you're flying because it has reached equilibrium. In ARC, because it gets larger, that time scale stretches more to sort of like 30 minutes. And then, and then, and then that would be the basis for building, you know, the practical power plant. Okay, thank you very much. I think we could go on for another half an hour or an hour oh, with yes. the questions, but I will just pick up one final point because okay. there are several questions in the chat related basically to the same topic. So if you can say a few words about the additional heating mechanisms, uh, both in Spark and Arc, as they are foreseen, uh, since just to tell, uh, in most of the tokamaks uh, and not only tokamaks, of course. Uh, uh, heating mechanisms going beyond the ohmic heating, which in Tokamax is given uh, from the current which is flowing to the plasmas are required. Mm -hmm. So what about these aspects for the two machines? Yeah, so in Spark will have only um, so-called ion cyclotron range of frequency heating. What does this mean? Well, this, is, this exploits the fact that the, those particles that I showed you, uh, the, 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 the part, the, the heavy particles, the fusion particles are undergoing, have a fixed frequency that is set by the magnetic field. And this turns out to be order of 100 megahertz. Of, so this is FM radio uh, frequencies. So this is uh, launched into the plasma, exploits this resonance to basically convert the electromagnetic power into, into thermal energy of those systems. So Spark will have only that. Uh, and the reason for this is that the other techniques, uh, uh, we, we can't do the one at the electron cyclotron heating because of the, the, the field, the, the frequency is too high. Uh, there's other techniques that are out there, but they don't work because the density of the fuel is too high. So basically, in the end, this is the one that works. And why do we know it works? It's because it's the one that we used on, uh, on Alcatraz CMOD. It will be 25 megawatts of installed power of this. So this is about the size of the heating power on jet. Uh, that also you had substantial amounts of ion cyclotron range of frequency. In, 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 uh, in ARC, we're actually we're holding out options in different ways on this. So one of the ways, that right now our primary one for ARC would be to use the same heating scheme so that we change as little between Spark and ARC. Um, but there's some challenges around the launcher technology. This is another part of the integrated engineering of the, of the, of the components which are inside. But we're also trying out something a, a little bit more advanced, which is so-called inside launch lower hybrid current drive. Uh, that, I know that takes a long time. This is a different way to help extend the pulse length of the plasma and make it more efficient, sort of from a thermal point of view. That's being tested right now on, or soon on the D3D token back in San Diego. So th those, are, those are the ranges. So we will not use neutral beam heating. We will not use electron cyclotron heating. I see. So thank you very much. I think it's really time to close. So I just would like to understand whether there is one final very urgent question, comment you would like to I give here. So if not, I thank very much again, yeah. Professor Dennis White. <laughs> and I would like to thank all of you. Really, it's been a uh, very nice uh, to have such hundreds of people talking about nuclear fusion at Politecnico di Milano. So I hope there will be soon uh, another opportunity. So thanks again and thank you all of you.